So yeah, here's, here's a plan. I'll do a quick round of introductions. Um, we will just, you know, who we are and, and what this is about. Jason will, will give his presentation and uh, we'll have Q&A at the end. So just recapping that. Um, I, my name is Corey Snipes. I'm hosting a meeting. I'm on the board of directors of North Coast Drone Alliance. Um, we have a number of other board members and, and members here. So um, thanks to everybody for joining. I see there are a lot of people from outside our organization, which is great. Um, I'm a aerospace software engineer. I'm also a 107 certified remote pilot. Uh, my, my drone focus is aerial photography and 3D modeling around urban development, um, public spaces and, and shoreline stuff. So that's my specific interest area. Our group has tons of people who work in all, you know, pretty much every corner of the, of the industry. Um, but that's, that's my area. So um, our group itself, we're an independent nonprofit. Um, we formed in 2019. We're based in the Cleveland area, as I mentioned, and uh, we're just a group of people who are either currently active um, professional drone pilots in one capacity or another, or people are, are interested in it. Um, our group exists to provide resources, um, programs and regional events and, and basically connect people who are working or interested in this industry. So um, as far as resources and connections go, we do uh, quite a few presentations in schools and other um, outlets like that for students and STEM programs. We have, um, we have some resources and provide you know, informal mentorship and just, you know, people to bounce ideas off of for people who are new pilots or interested in getting into it. Um, and if you're someone who's interested in starting a drone professional business, we have some resources for that. Um, and a lot of people, frankly, who have just done all the trial and error already themselves. Um, and, you know, people like Jason, Mike and Patty, who are keen to, you know, give back to the community. And so um, we're here to, we're here to help. So that is our, that's our shtick. So we're drone people. Uh, we also work with public safety and first responders. We work a bit with higher education and research, uh, a couple of local colleges and universities, as well as municipal and government folks. So that's us. Uh, this event is part of our public education series. I um, mentioned this at the top. We used to do these in person um, and get together and have one or two presentations and some informal discussion and some food and just some, some kind of hangout time, which was great. COVID to put a stop to that. So we're um, restarting this slowly um, with these virtual meetings. So we are planning uh, virtual and potentially in-person meetups this year. We did a, a meet and fly out at the Cleveland Metro Parks Top of Ledges um, in 2019, which was great. It was super fun. Uh, I think we'll do that again this year. We don't have it currently on the books, but uh, I would look for that this summer. And we try and get together either for one of these presentations or something monthly. Um, if you are interested in future events and that kind of stuff, if you don't already get our newsletter, you can get that at our website, norcoda.org, um, or on our Facebook, the events get cross posted both places. So if you follow us in one of those places, you'll see it. All right, now the main event, enough of me talking, uh, Jason Damon, has kindly offered to give this presentation today. He is the founder and owner of and chief pilot at V1 Drone Media. He's a, been a commercial airline pilot for 20 years, very experienced fellow in the air. Um, he's an FAA certified remote pilot as well, of course. He's an instructor at Tri C Law Enforcement Drone Academy and uh, chief pilot and owner of Drone Media, as I mentioned. He's a regular speaker at our events. Um, he does all kinds of stuff with the community and just general, like, informal mentoring and he's been super helpful to me personally and uh, just an all-around great guy so we're glad to have him. Jason gets called up when uh, the national media organizations like Washington Post, Amazon, um, NFL folks come to town um, they often frequently call Jason uh, to do aerial work for them so he's certainly experienced and uh, just a great guy to know. Um, so with that I'll turn it over to Jason. I'll stop sharing, put myself on mute. Let's see. All right. You got me? I see you. Well, thanks for that kind intro. It makes it sound like I should have all the answers. <laughs> but uh, let me see if I can 
screen share here. Actually, at first, um, yeah, Corey covered most of it. Uh, my background, I was 20 year airline pilot. I've been building flying rear control airplanes, uh, helicopters since I was a kid. So the drone stuff was um, kind of a no brainer for me. Started off as just an interest to uh, kind of do something with the hobby side of things. And then uh, ended up starting my own business and uh, took off from there. So I've been doing that since uh, I started in 2016 um, and every year it's just more and more stuff coming in. So it's been great. Um, we're hoping here, let's see if we can share this screen, if it'll work to go over some of the, I lost, oh, there it is. There we go. All right. Can All right. everybody see that? Is that the full screen or full the screen. shared? Okay. Yep. All right. So remote ID. Uh, some of you may have heard the rules are going to be changing. There's a lot of confusion out there on um, what is in effect right now. Is, is remote ID in effect? And uh, can I fly over people? There's a lot of confusion all over some of this stuff. So hopefully this presentation will clear up some of that. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions like Corey mentioned after I kind of go through some of this. Um, so some of the stuff we're gonna cover here, uh, why do we need remote ID uh, and what is it? Um, who does remote ID affect? Um, there's some other things that are also changing under the remote ID rule. We're gonna cover some of those. Obviously you have the remote ID itself. Um, recurrent training uh, for part 107 is also gonna be changing. Um, nighttime operations uh, and operations over people and over moving vehicles is now going to be uh, a possibility under the new remote ID rules. Uh, so we'll cover all of that. And then we're going to look at the remote ID implement implementation, uh, the timeline uh, for how all of this stuff is going to be implemented um, because it's kind of a phase in uh, type of deal uh, how all of this is going to go into effect. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is from the FAA uh, website. So drones or unmanned aircraft systems are fundamentally changing aviation. Uh, the FAA is committed to working to fully integrate drones into the national airspace system. Uh, safety is a, and security are top priorities. And the remote identification, remote ID of drones is crucial to our integration efforts. Remote ID also lays the foundation of the safety and security groundwork needed for more complex drone operations. So that's the FAA's uh, reasoning behind uh, wanting to implement this uh, remote ID um, rule. Uh, you may know, some may, may not. Uh, last year, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, it was last year, uh, December of 19. Uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking on remote identification of unmanned aircraft system was published uh, December 31st, 2019, and then they opened up for comments. They received over 53,000 comments on the NPRM. That's just the notice of proposed rulemaking uh, during the 60-day comment period. Uh, so there was obviously a lot of people wanting to get their comments in on this. Um, the FAA then posted the rules uh, after reviewing those comments, there were changes made to the initial uh, remote ID rule that they were looking at implementing. Uh, and some of that was good because some of it they backed off on, on some of the things that they were looking to implement. Uh, but uh, December 30, 2020 is when the final rule uh, was submitted to the Federal Register for publication. Um, and we'll get into some of that uh, a little bit later because based on that timeline is when all these things start to go into effect. You can um, read up more if you'd like. The, they have uh, a lot of information on the FAA.gov uh, website on remote ID. Um, right there's a link. Uh, you can also just Google search it, uh, FAA uh, remote ID, and you should be able to get to the same location. Uh, so you can kind of study up some more on that there. Um, what is remote ID? 
so the remote ID is just, it's the ability of a drone in flight to provide identification and location information that can be received by other parties. The drone is transmitting uh, in real time its current location uh, as well as uh, the remote location uh, while the drone's in flight. Um, why do we need remote ID? Uh, this helps the FAA, law enforcement, and other federal agencies find the control station when a drone appears to be flying in an unsafe manner or where it is not allowed to fly. Uh, remote ID also lays the foundation of the safety and security groundwork needed for more complex drone operations. Um, thing, like uh, things like line of sight, uh, beyond line of sight, uh, flying and things like that. Um, we've all seen the, the news stories and YouTube videos and things like that, people doing really stupid stuff uh, with their drone. Um, this is to help curb uh, some of those things from happening. And, you know, they will be able to um, track where, where the drone is and also where the remote is. Uh, so if somebody's trying to fly, say, downtown Cleveland during an Indians game, when there's a TFR in effect, um, they will be able to fly, find uh, the drone and the operator uh, to go after them. So who needs to comply with this rule? Uh, essentially, uh, anybody that has to register their UAS. Um, all drone pilots required to register their UAS must operate their aircraft in accordance with the final rule on remote ID beginning September 16th, 2023, uh, which gives drone, op uh, drone owners sufficient time to upgrade their aircraft. Um, so essentially, this is not in effect yet. There are certain things that are slowly going to be implemented and you'll be allowed to do uh, under the new rule. Uh, but the full implementation for the remote, remote ID portion uh, doesn't go into effect as of now, uh, September 16th, 2023. And, and who knows, maybe, you know, things could change. They could change that date. But, uh, but for now, that's, that's what they're looking at. Um, and if you remember, any drone um, above 0.55 pounds would uh, need to be registered. So any of those drones that need to be registered, they're going to be uh, have to have to be operated under remote ID rules as well. So what are the different ways uh, that we're going to be able to comply with the remote ID rule? Uh, you've got three different ways here. Um, you you'll be able to operate a standard remote ID drone that broadcasts identification and location information about the drone and its locate uh, uh, control location. Uh, a standard remote ID drone is one that is produced with built-in remote ID broadcast capability in accordance with the remote ID rules. Um, so eventually what's going to happen is new drones that are coming out uh, will have to have this implemented uh, in, into the drone. It'll be, that'll be, that's going to be considered the standard remote ID drone. Um, there's also going to be, so if you don't have a drone that has built in uh, remote ID, maybe you build your own drones or things like that. Um, you, the other way you could satisfy this is having a remote ID broadcast module, uh, which would essentially be like a third party module that you would add to an existing drone uh, that does not have the built in remote ID capability. Uh, which uh, this is a broadcast module is a device that broadcasts identification and location information about the drone and its takeoff location in accordance with the remote ID rule. Uh, the broadcast uh, module can be added to a drone to retrofit it with remote ID capability. Uh, persons operating a drone with remote ID broadcast module must be able to see their drone at all times during flight. Uh, this kind of hints at, you know, does it mean that standard remote ID drones, uh, drones with the standard remote ID built in, will they eventually, are they looking at, you know, maybe beyond line of sight type, type of flying um, versus having the broadcast module, which specifically states you must be able to see the drone at all times during flight? I don't know. It's, it's kind of interesting that that's mentioned there. Um, and then the third way, if you can't meet the first two, which is essentially you don't have a drone that has the remote ID capabilities, um, you would have to operate 
and what is going to be known as a FRIA, F-R-I-A, or a, which is a Fed, uh, FAA recognized identification area. And these are sponsored by community-based organizations or educational institutions. Um, FRIAs are the only locations that unmanned aircraft, drones, and radio controlled airplanes may operate without broadcasting remote ID message elements. So essentially, if you're a hobbyist or you don't have a drone um, that has a remote ID capability built in, you're going to be restricted to flying only uh, in these uh, FRIAs or FAA recognized identification areas. This is a uh, just a little uh, graphic kind of breaking this all down uh, visually. Um, the the left for this left uh, is showing like a standard remote ID drone. The drone broadcasts remote ID info via radio frequency. Uh, it's built into the drone. Um, you can find this graphic. Uh, I think this this is on the FAA website too. Um, the the link I gave that I showed you earlier, or if you just Google it, like I said, it's on the FAA.gov site. Um, if you want to review this further, but um, I don't, I'm not going to read all of it there, but it just breaks down in a visual format what I essentially just went over. Uh, compliance dates. Um, so obviously it's going to take some time for uh, the standard remote ID drones to become available, um, which is part of why this isn't going to be, um, you know, the final rule isn't in effect until September of 2022, uh, the, or I'm sorry, 2023. The compliance date for manufacturers is 18 months after the rule's original effective date. Uh, the rule's original effective date was March 16th. And so the compliance date for manufacturers is gonna be September 16th of 2022. So any new drones coming out from manufacturers uh, to have the standard remote ID built into the drone is September 16th of 2022. So a little less than 18 months at this point. Uh, the compliance date for operators is 30 months after the original rules effective date. Uh, that's where we got the September 16th, 2023 date from. So manufacturers have to comply within 18 months and then operators uh, gives you time to buy new drones or equipment, whatever you need. Uh, gives you that 12 months extra to uh, to get ready for it. So what information will be broadcast? Uh, whether you're using a standard remote ID drone or remote ID broadcast module, the message elements must be broadcast from takeoff to shutdown. Uh, a standard remote ID drone or a drone with a remote ID broadcast module must transmit the following message elements. Uh, it's a unique identifier for the drone, basically kind of like a license plate uh, number. Uh, the drone's latitude, longitude, geometric altitude, and velocity. An indication of the lat, long, and geometric altitude of the control station uh, or takeoff location if you're using the broadcast module. A time mark and emergency status. Um, so like I mentioned, it's, it's basically in real time you'll they'll be able to track where the drone is uh, as as well as where the um, the control station is so getting into a few other things with remote id that's changing um, you may have heard that recurrent training will now be done online and there will no longer be a charge for that uh, the way part 107 has been working in the past is every two years uh, you would have to go set up a time to go to the testing site. Uh, you pay your 150 bucks and you take the FAA recurrent uh, UAS test. Uh, you pass it, you're good for another two years, uh, repeat uh, over and over again. Uh, they're getting rid of that and it's now going to all be done online. There's no charge for this. Um, the initial Part 107 knowledge exam is still administered through the testing center. Uh, and it's no longer going to be, once you get the initial 107 test done, you'll do the recurrent training, no longer testing, recurrent training uh, now all online. Uh, night operations are also changing with this uh, recurrent training that you'll be doing online. 
operational daylight waivers will no longer be required um, starting 45 days after the publication, which I believe is the end of this month. Uh, the FAA will have the study material for the recurrent training. Oh, this is never mind. This is talking about. So yeah, the 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 recurrent um, material, uh, the recurrent training is actually now online. Uh, you can go online now uh, to take the recurrent training. Uh, Mike, I don't. I think you've taken that already. Maybe we can. You can talk through that a little bit later once we're done with that. But uh, yeah, if you are coming up on uh, needing to do the testing, you can do that now online and become current again. If you do the online training, uh, the cool thing is with this, night operations is now included. So once you do the recurrent training, you it, it gives you all this training material on night operations. Uh, you complete everything and boom, you can now fly legally at night. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Hey, Jason, we've got a question in the chat from Mike um, about will hobbyists be allowed to fly at night? Is that part 107 folks only for the night operations? Uh, well, this is all for 107, remember. Right. So hobbyists that, yeah, that's that's separate. Um, and, and this is recurrent training. Gotcha. You know, so if you're hobbyists strictly and you don't have a 107, then this none of this applies to you. This this only applies to 107. Makes sense. So so if you have your if you already have your 107, um, you'll be able to do the recurrent training online, and that will all include this night nighttime operations at this point. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so something else that's changing. This gets a little wordy and kind of confusing. Uh, but they're also giving uh, operations over people now as well. And the way they've done this is they've broken it into four different categories of aircraft. And it's essentially based on weight as well as, as a few other things. Um, so we'll kind of quickly go through these. Um, category one is a small M air, small M aircraft that weighs less than 0.55 pounds. So these are small little drones, less than 250 grams. Uh, or 0.55 pounds, including everything on board. Um, they cannot contain any exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin. Um, we're gonna get into this, no FAA accepted means of compliance or declaration of compliance required. We're gonna explain those here in just a second. Um, but for now, um, operations over people for category one is a small aircraft. It cannot ex have exposed rotating parts. So essentially you have to have uh, propeller cages uh, on that drone in order to meet the category one uh, requirements. Uh, that is the least restrictive. They get more restrictive from there because we're getting into bigger aircraft essentially. Category two is a small man aircraft um, must not cause injury to a human being that is equivalent to or greater than the severity of injury caused by a transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy upon impact from a rigid object. And it again, cannot contain any exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin upon impact with a human being uh, and does not contain any safety defects. Re this requires an FAA accepted means of compliance and an FAA accepted declaration of compliance. So here we're getting into some weird stuff, right? Category two, essentially what's going on, um, don't get too wrapped up in all this. A lot of this is gonna be what the manufacturers of these drones are going to have to prove to the FAA that their drone meets. So they're gonna have to prove to the FAA that their drone does not uh, cause a transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic injury energy upon an impact uh, from a rigid object with this drone from this height, blah, 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 blah. If the drone you buy, uh, you know, the, the manufacturer says it meets the category two FAA requirements for flights above people or whatever the wording is going to be, um, then you would be able to fly that drone under category two uh, over people. But again, a lot of this is going to be what this uh, FAA accepted means of compliance and FAA accepted declaration of compliance, that's going to be stuff that the manufacturers are going to have to deal with in proving to the FAA that their drone that they've made 
uh, meets uh, the FAA rules for category two. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, categories three, uh, two and three have that same thing uh, that they both require the ex, uh, FAA accepted means of compliance and declaration of compliance. Uh, so category three, uh, again, it's the same stuff. Now we get into, uh, it cannot uh, cause greater than a transfer of 25 foot pounds of kinetic energy upon impact from a rigid object. And then all this stuff down here is pretty much the same. You cannot have any exposed rotating parts that would lacerate human skin, and they are going to have to have the means of compliance and accept a declaration of compliance as well to meet category three operations over people. Category four is the most restrictive of them all. Um, they are actually treating cat category four UAS for operations over people no differently than they would a manned aircraft, essentially. Um, it's gonna, they're gonna require an airworthiness certificate. They're gonna require regular maintenance uh, and things like that. So uh, small man aircraft must have an airworthiness certificate issued under part 21 of FAA regulations, must be operated in accordance with the operating limitations specified in the approved flight manual or as otherwise specified by the administrator. Uh, the operating limitations must not prohibit operations over human being. Uh, must have maintenance, preventive maintenance, alterations or inspections performed in accordance with specific requirements in the final rule. So this, as you can see, is, is getting pretty, pretty restrictive and requires a lot uh, more stuff to uh, go through to be able to operate over people. Um, it does require airworthiness certificate. Uh, that shows it meets the operation over people criteria and those submittals uh, may start taking place six to 12 months after the effective date of the rule, which was March 16th of this year. Uh, so that would be as early as what, uh, like September of this year, they may start getting um, those. Uh, categories two and three above must have a declaration of compliance to qualify under the respective criteria. Those can start being submitted nine to 12 months after the effective date. And categories two and three is most likely where most people are gonna fall. That would be, you know, your Mavic 2s, the Mavic uh, Airs, the Phantom 4 Pros, you know, stepping into category three, I would imagine something like the Inspires, the Inspire 2, things like that. Uh, so those would be nine to 12 months after the effective date, which would put us into uh, like February of next year um, when those can start being submitted. Uh, operations over moving vehicles, it's following the same categories as operations over people. Um, it must be a category one, two, and uh, three eligible to operate over people, may not maintain sustained flight over moving vehicles. Uh, it's transit operations only. So essentially you can only fly, you know, essentially perpendicular to traffic. You would not be able to fly, uh, sustained flight over top of a road, essentially parallel uh, with the road over top of the road. Uh, for an operation under category one, two, or three, the small man aircraft throughout the operation must remain within or over a closed or restricted access site. And all human beings located inside a moving vehicle within the closed or restricted site must be on notice that a small man aircraft may fly over them, or you must not maintain sustained flight over moving vehicles. Essentially what that's saying is if you're on a closed set, say you're on a movie set or something like that, um, it was a restricted access site, uh, you could sustain flight over top of the moving vehicle if you're filming a car, for an example. Um, it's just they would have to be briefed and be aware that that aircraft is flying over them and at any time, you know, something could happen if things go wrong. Uh, for category four, the small man aircraft must uh, literally, it's very similar to what we talked about uh, with operations over people. It's going to need an airworthiness certificate uh, and be operated in accordance with the operating limitations specified in the approved flight manual or as otherwise specified by the administrator. Uh, operating limitations must not prohibit uh, operations over human beings located inside moving vehicles. So the summary here, uh, this is essentially the timeline 
uh, kind of the rollout as to how this is all going to happen. The effective rule date, which is not when you have to comply with remote ID, uh, was actually March, uh, I think it was March 16th of 21. Uh, when this was written up, um, I wasn't sure yet where we were going to fall, but it was March March 16th of 2021 is the effective rule date. The remote ID compliance date, which we already discussed earlier, it's actually September 16th, uh, 2023. That's when you have to fly a standard remote ID drone, have the module, or you have to fly in a FRIA, the FAA recognized identification area. That's September 16, 2023. The drone manufacturer compliance date, which is when the manufacturers have to produce drones uh, that are for sale in the United States that are in compliance with the rule is September of 20, it's September 16th of 2022. Uh, the FRIA rule, uh, that's when the applications can start being submitted uh, to apply to be a FRIA, uh, FAA recognized identification area is September of 2022. Uh, night operations rule is is essentially in effect. Uh, January training, yeah. So the the March they kept pushing the training back. Uh, the recurrent uh, training for online it is now available, like I mentioned. And once you go through that training, uh, your night operations uh, you're good to do that. Um, once you take the online training, operations over people rule effective date. Uh, is January with a delay until category? See, yeah, this isn't going to really go into effect until the category two through four means of compliance and declaration of compliance are accepted by the FAA. Um, and that's going to be that at least probably nine to 12 months uh, that we mentioned earlier. So just so we're clear, you can't go online, take the recurrent training and fly over people, uh, essentially. That said, if you, I, I believe if you have a drone that's 250 grams or less, and you have prop guards on it where there's no open rotating parts that can lacerate skin, um, I believe that you can actually do that now, um, I believe. I would have to double check that and make sure you, you check up on it as well uh, and make sure you know all the restrictions on that. But uh, I think that may be the case. Um, online recurrent training instead of the test, um, like I said, that's already available now. So you can go online and do that. Uh, one additional note to kind of wrap some of this up. Um, under the uh, NPRM, recreational drone pilots had to have a unique registration number for each aircraft. Um, under the final rule, you will be able to register once and you'll be able to use that same registration. If you have 10 UAS and you're just flying recreationally, uh, you no longer have to buy a registration number for each aircraft. It's just one registration number and you can share it on all the aircraft you have. If you're just recreational, uh, this does not apply if you're part 107, uh, but just throwing that out there because that was in the rules as well. Um, Anything else in here during the have to this? Uh, uh, if they use a remote ID broadcast module, the module serial number must be listed on the registration, which will permit them to move the module from unmanned aircraft to unmanned aircraft, so long as the unmanned aircraft are on the same registration number. And that wraps it up for me. Um, see what you guys have to say. Uh, we can open it up for questions. Maybe Mike, if you want to kind of talk about the online training since you've already done it. Corey, do we have any other? Uh... No other questions in the chat. People are welcome to un unmute themselves if you, have, uh, if you have questions. I have a couple of questions. I can, I can kick it off, but I'll, I, I'll wait uh, and see if anybody else has. I'm sure this is just speculation, but uh, what do you think they're going to deal with people who are flying uh, custom built drones, because I, I do know there is a decent amount of hobbyists who do build their own drones. Not as many who use them for part 107 missions, but um, how do you think that's going to 
affect flying over people and flying over vehicles. Do you think, I, once again, it's all speculation at this point. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting about all of this is it requires the operator to even comply with the rule to begin with. Um, I'm sure there's going to be people that are even that, you know, that, that won't even comply. That being said though, if you do get caught, it's probably going to be that much worse of a penalty uh, beings that this is going to be the new rule. Um, you know, if you are flying a home built uh, aircraft, you know, you're, you're going to have to put, you know, a broadcast module on it uh, come September 16th, uh, 2023, as, as it stands right now. Um, you know, the, the FAA has put out stuff before, you know, even with the recurrent training test, they've kicked the can down the road. So will that date actually stick? I don't know how much of this is going to change between now and then. I don't know. Um, but, you know, as of today, this is kind of where we're at with everything. I'm not, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but um, unless you want to expand on it further, or is that? Yeah, I mean, I I understand how they're going to get remote ID into self-built aircraft, but flying over people and flying over vehicles, that seems like something that they can't quite address for self-built aircraft unless you have some sort of a process to get yours certified. Yeah, right. In which you would, yeah, I, I I can't speak to that, I guess, as of right now. You would almost have to have a way to show that, you know, you're going to meet that the criteria um, in order to use it legally. <laughs> yeah, I would I would agree with that. I, my expectation would be that you would need somehow to demonstrate to the FAA um, that your vehicle meets those criteria. Right. Hey, I'll say... Um... So I took the recurrent training the first day it was available. I think if I'm not mistaken, Chad has as well. Um, and I, I really went through the whole thing, read everything, did the practice um, questions and all that. And I got hundred percent on it. It really was not difficult. Um, and I thought, I thought the regular test was, you know, somewhat difficult and even after doing quite a bit of studying for it, but the recurrent I thought was fairly easy and the price was right too. So um, took me about, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half or something like that to go through it. Did it, um, first thing in the morning, tried to do it at midnight and I couldn't find it, you know, when it supposedly, uh, went into effect, but uh, I think I did it at about seven o'clock in the morning and it was, uh, it was online on the six. So, um, yeah, if you're, if you already have your 107, you do the, the recurrent training, not a big deal. So you can, you can get through it pretty easily. Would you guys recommend, sorry, this, uh, turn my video on here. Um, would you guys recommend for somebody that already has their 107 that's not due yet, um, just to go ahead and take it? It seems like it might open some doors for night operations and things like that. Right. Yeah, you, you can uh, if you need to. Um, aside from the night operation stuff, I, you know, that would be really, I think, the only big benefit to doing it. Yeah. A lot of people are going to do that, um, especially with everything coming up, what, the 21st, I think it was, uh, where they come into effect. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's no reason not to, especially if it's free, and it's going to open that up. Um, it has been suggested to do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Did I, I, there's no way I could have explained this all that well, that there's no questions. See, I did have one other one. I, I felt I'm having trouble putting my finger on it now, but I felt like there was a gap right where right. we are right now between um, um, the recurrent track line and the actual ability to do night operations and operations over people. I feel like April 21st was the date when a 
when those rules took effect, but I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not able to put my. Yeah, I think there is Corey. Yeah. I know there's one of those. I think it's that one that it's not actually in effect until yeah. Like April 21st, you have a week and one day yet, eight days. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I, I probably won't be adding that to my operations anytime soon, but I am pretty excited about the night operations. I got to say there's some nice. Some yeah. Nice and, and to, you know, the only, the only one that you'd be able to do is the category one at that point anyway, because it's going to be at least roughly a year. Right. I mean, and again, this is where we're at this moment. I mean, who knows? It could be 18 months, but you know, the, the drone manufacturers and stuff, they, they're going to have to come up with all this stuff to show the 11 foot pound, 25 foot pound, blah, 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 you know, to show that their drone meets the FAA, right. You know, criteria, uh, to be able to fly over people. So, you know, we're not, we're not close to that yet. Um, I'd say at least a year. Hey, Jason, did they say anything about parachutes and, uh, if that will suffice there's nothing that i've seen that specifically talks about that um i don't know you know it's going to be interesting to see what they come out with on this whole means of compliance and means of declaration stuff right you know are they going to start giving some leeway to things like that you know if your drone has other safety features like the parachute systems and things like that that you know maybe that would suffice i don't know there's i haven't seen anything anywhere that specifically states you know parachute systems w would fall into any category i think tim had a question that i don't know that we answered uh, um said i just completed the part 107 recurrent last month so i assume that means well that would have to mean before the new rules took an effect on the sixth so am i required to take the new course to remain current i believe no is that correct no he's he's current under the old way um that said if he doesn't have a night waiver or anything like that if he wants to fly at night he'd have to make sure he has the old way of getting the night it's actually a daylight waiver but um, you know, to be able to fly at night. Um, whereas, and Mike, you, you took the recurrent. I've heard it's what, 30, 45 minutes. Well, I, you know, I went through it kind of slow. I was still half asleep in the morning. So it took me a little longer, but the test, the, the, it's a, they do actually have a test at the end. Uh, was it 45 questions or 65? I think it was 45. Um, and you had to get a hundred percent on it and you could go back and redo it, you know, anything that you missed, um, you could go back and correct them and, um, and review or something, but I got, I got them all right the first time. So I don't know what that was like. Um, but I believe they said on the 21st, all of the old daylight waivers expire. Is that, is that the way you understood it or not? Of this month? Yeah. I, or no, wait a minute. No. No, I think that goes for another couple, three months, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I I'd have to look at that. I think um, all the I think all the old daylight waivers are going to sunset sometime in the near future. Not not the 21st. Not that's not it. Chad, do you know anything about that? Um. So I, there there was rumor about it. I never. Um, double checked into it because uh, I was kind of covered either way. But I haven't heard anything. I don't know how they could do that when, cause I got my, I renewed my daylight waiver. Uh, it was like November, December last year. And it's got an expiration date on it. I don't, and I haven't seen anything like, Hey, just so you know, like, we're, we're changing the date on your daylight waiver uh, and it's gonna expire in two months. Uh, so I, I haven't heard really anything on that. Um, but to, I mean, I, 
not to get too far out uh, to answer Tim's question. It's if he's, if he just renewed, it's no rush really. Um, if he doesn't have the, you know, daylight waiver and he really wanted to get his, you know, to be able to fly at night and things like that, it may be just as easy for him to just go online and take the recurrent training uh, versus filling out all the paperwork and submitting and having to wait several days uh, for the FAA to get back on, uh, you know, approving uh, a daylight waiver, he could go online and take the free training and, and get the nighttime stuff included. Jason, I stole the uh, presentation from you here. I, I put up our uh, Norcota information website, Facebook. I've got your website and Instagram up there. Or is it, are there other places you'd like people to be able to get a hold of you? Uh, no, that's 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 good. You can. We're we're also yeah. Fa we're also on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, all that stuff. But yeah, there's the website, Instagram. It's probably what we're where we're at the most, I suppose. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll um, we'll stick around for a minute if if other people have questions. Um, I just want to thank Jason for putting the material together and, and giving the briefing on this. This is obviously very timely, extremely confusing um, because there are a lot of moving parts and the dates keep changing. Um, so thanks for summing that up. Um, uh, I also want to thank the Norcota members and supporters because that's how you know these meetings happen and that's, that's how they get to be free. Um, so thanks to everybody who's a part of that. Thanks to the folks that are here for the first time that maybe haven't attended one of our events or aren't familiar with our organization. Um, appreciate everyone showing up and, and asking questions and just coming to chat and uh, learn a little bit. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Just trying to be proactive. Are the remote IDs available now if you wanted to get one and put it on your drone currently? No, there's, there's nothing uh, right now. Uh, that you can get or use. Um, it's it's going to be, like I said, uh, I mean, none, none of it actually even technically goes into effect for, what, 16 Jeez. and a half months or 17 months from now? Okay. What is today? Yeah. Yeah, so there's nothing, yeah. There's nothing that you could you really do as of today. Have you heard anything from DJI? Are they anticipating a software update or anything that you're aware of? I haven't heard anything specifically, um, but I, you know, I'm sure that they're aware of all of this and already have plans. Uh, but as to what they are, I don't think anybody knows. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. yeah. Welcome to that. The, the Mavic 3. I think it's supposed to be ready for RID and there's another one. It's not the 300. Uh, it's one of the smaller ones that I believe is, re is going, will be ready for our, our uh, remote ID. I, I think most everybody's looking at new equipment. I, I don't think remote ID is the sort of thing that could be rolled out with a, you know, DJI Go update or a, a, just a simple software update. Cause I think they're, you know, radio broadcast modules and things that have to be included. Yeah, so I, I think you're looking at new new hardware. It's going to be hardware that's going to be dependent on it. So it's not it's not something that's just a software update or a firmware update. Ha having said that, though, I would anticipate um, some kind of bolt-on broadcast module um, to be available before the manufacturer deadline because I would think there would be some you know, small equipment folks rushing to be first to market with that sort of thing, since it's small and pretty straightforward. And as far as I know, there are no data standards around that either. So how far, you know, on what frequencies and what type of radio broadcast it needs to be, I think is unspecified. Um, I think it's just the content. And so I would expect it'll be sort of the wild west in terms of um, what's getting broadcast and by what type of radios for a while. Yeah, I think the one, uh, let me look here real quick. Can I 
Can I take the uh, screen yeah. here again real yeah, quick? Yeah, sure. I think I have to stop. Okay, there we go. Yeah, go for it. I think this... You stupid thing. Uh, that one graphic had Can you see that? Yep. Uh, via radio frequency, uh, e.g. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I don't know if that's... So there's probably, I mean, it could be, you know. So that could actually be yeah. something that comes off of your controller, your iPad, it looks like. Oh, I was thinking it was off the aircraft. I think for uh, the- That's one way to do it. We've always, yeah. you know, this is one of the things that we are a little bit confused about, about the effectiveness of it. Mm. Because if you see that, let's say it's running off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. What's the effective range ah. of Bluetooth? You know, that's not that far. Well, th yeah, that, that wouldn't be able to work from the aircraft. Right. So it, it, they're not- they weren't very clear on how that's supposed to work. I don't think anybody really knows. Yeah. Left themselves some time to figure it out, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. And you know, with any timeline from a federal agency, yeah. they're, they're <laughs> always right on. They nail it every yeah. time. <laughs> that's right. If not early. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's um, let's make it. Uh, let's see if anybody else has any any closing questions. And uh, if not, I think we'll turn everyone loose. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, have a good evening. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Yep. Good night, everybody. <laughs>